we understand what regenerative ag is about. It's about microbial health and carbon cycling. So we're into the practices of it. And, and these aren't, you know, obviously, I haven't come up with these. These are the sort of, you know, the six well-known ones that are, that are written about quite regularly now that are all part of this system that is working on those two elements in the middle. So um, as we're going along, you know, what we'd like to do, uh, what I'm going to do now is give some examples of what I saw, you know, in different areas around the world, sometimes in different systems of all of these things interplaying um, so that potentially we can look at it as a, as a, as a system that viticulture and wine growing can uh, talk along the way to make some changes on what and obviously what we're doing already. So we look at maximising soil coverage first. I mean, this, this seems like a no-brainer. Um, and I saw some really good examples, obviously, around the world. So if we look at the vineyard on the right-hand side, um, Terra Sancta was in a, a central Otago. Um, it's a considerably drier uh, environment than I really gave it credit for until I got there. Um, they're only running at around 350 mils of rainfall a year. Um, and incredibly cold, obviously, in winter as well. Um, so what, uh, what Connell, the vineyard manager here, was doing uh, was obviously using a really diverse uh, mid-row cover crop uh, throughout the year that you know, he was mulching down um, with, a, with a mulcher to leave a really thick um, layer of grass um, throughout the year in the mid-row. Now, that, this doesn't sound particularly uh, in, you know, sort of cutting edge, but the way he was going about it was really interesting. So all of this is planted... Um, with no-till equipment. He doesn't do any cultivation there. Um, so it's, it's, it's utilising that technology that's been around for a long time. Um, he does do livestock grazing across this, um, but he's also doing controlled traffic um, work. So every second year, he stays off one of the mid-rows. Um, so he's developed his equipment so that it can go over the top. And the only time that he runs down, the one pass that he runs down um, this mid-row is to do his spring um, cover crop drop and leaves it there and then he stays off it for the entire rest of the season. Everything's hand-picked. Um, and it's an interesting property because it is, uh, what I've tried to, to do around the world was to find uh, areas that are a commercial scale uh, because obviously these things are a bit easier to do on a small um, area, but he's running um, nearly 50 hectares here and it's all done uh, in this manner. Um, the other place I visited, which is down that way, is Lindburn Station, um, a little bit further to the east, and an incredibly harsh environment. It's a, it's a grazing and cattle property um, that, uh, again, only has about 400 mils rainfall, mostly in winter, um, well, sorry, in spring, actually. Winter, it actually snows, so they've got uh, minus 20 degrees there quite often, and then up to 40 degrees in summer. So incredible temperature range. Um, the photo uh, that you see on the on the right there is a ricorn cover crop that um, has been planted, um, again, with no-till technology. He's just uh, um, Peter Barrett, the owner that's standing with me, uh, has drilled that in. And then what they've done there is just crimp rolled it um, to then put in their summer um, pasture mix for the cattle. So... So they've grown that, that stand of biomass uh, during the winter and then rolled it in to then put in their uh, summer cover crop, keeping all that moisture underneath there and, allow, and now enabling them to have um, you know, plant cover, cover all year round uh, and living roots all, all year round, which we'll see later on. Um, it's fairly important to this whole system. So a you know, really interesting way of using um, you know, less tractor passes, um, not doing too much soil disturbance, but still giving um, you know, really good soil coverage um, throughout the year. And I saw this happen time and time again um, in uh, the northern, uh, northern hemisphere in the US and in Canada, where corn uh, producers were using uh, the rye corn as a, as a base and then planting their corn crops into um, it with great effect. So again, another picture of um, Terra Sancta, another one of their vineyards where he's done, uh, Connell's done the first mowing pass. But interestingly, under Vine, um, you know, they're not doing any cultivation. So they've allowed, this was in December, even though it's looking fairly cold, um, you know, they've allowed that winter dominant cover crop just to hay off uh, and they'll leave it like that throughout the season. So, so even in a small, in a, even in a relatively low rainfall area, um, they're not seeing great competition from this grass. Um, they're pushing vine roots deep. Uh, and they're building organic matter on the soil because they're not disturbing it and turning it over regularly. So uh, really interesting use of that. The uh, uh, row on the right-hand side, you can see that um, he's doing some trials there with some 
low ground cover species that are just creeping along the bottom and they were quite active when I was there. And again, these, these vines were powering uh, on a fairly standard um, summer, uh, sorry, standard winter rainfall. Um, another vineyard I've visited in uh, Amador County, which is in California, up against the, um, the foothills um, out of Sacramento, quite an old region, not one that I was familiar with and familiar of until I got there. Um, but this vineyard um, was particularly well run and um, had a great um, sort of undervine management strategy where uh, over time they had um, in increased the amount of clover and medic uh, under vine by just very intensively, it must be said, and, and Anne Kramer, the manager, said it was a bit of a challenge to get to this point um, where they were just essentially by hand, we were snipping off all the taller grass seed heads over a number of years so that they promoted the, um, the medic and the clover uh, sward to come through underneath. Um, having Now that they've got to this period, they don't have to do anything. So this just naturally haze off um, during the summer. Uh, they don't actually run livestock in this vineyard, but uh, it, would, it would lend itself to it very well. Uh, and then all they have to do is mow the mid rows. So uh, again, with a bit of effort, um, she's now got to a stage where she's got a mid row and an undervine system that almost looks after itself. Um, and it's, as you can imagine, the infiltration here and the soil um, structure was excellent. So we're doing a little bit of it in McLaren Vale. This is a photo of our place at home, um, same row, um, where we're just trying to keep soil coverage all year round. I mean, it'd be great to have green, but um, it, we're obviously um, winter dominant rainfall, so we don't. But obviously, you know, we've transferred from what is a winter photo on the left to what we see in summer, where we've got a really good thick layer of um, mulch that's matted down. We've actually done this with a, with a cedar and, and laid it down flat. But we're keeping the soil covered and that's the main thing because we want to keep microbial activity happy and we also want to reduce the amount of heat that we're getting in the vineyard because I think some of the, the heat stress that we're seeing is actually reflective um, and you know, having a cover on the soil surface can reduce heat um, numbers quite considerably over the summer period. So the next one is minimising cultivation. Um, you know, we're not suggesting that we need to do away with it altogether because well-timed cultivation can have some benefits. And obviously as an industry that's moving, you know, looks like reasonably rapidly away from herbicide for a number of reasons, you know, cultivation is the obvious thing that people are going back to. But we want to minimise it. I mean, at the end of the day, over-cultivation, you know, you know, over time is just going to destroy our soil structure, our water holding Ability, infiltration rates and obviously it's no good for biology which we're trying to if that's one of our key pillars to build up um, that if we're going in there and smashing that up every five minutes then um, you know certainly fungal uh, populations are not going to enjoy that and we're not going to get the result we like so you know I saw a lot of it in California um, you know mid rows you know totally tilled you know, all on the premise that this is saving water. I think there's enough data around to suggest that this doesn't. We've got temperature increases here of up to 20 to 30 degrees of surface temperatures, um, as opposed to stuff under mulch. Uh, and unfortunately, we're seeing it still a lot in McLaren Vale, where you know after you know 20 mils of rain over three days, um, you can clearly see this water is not going where it needs to be going, which is into the subsoil. It's just laying off it. So. Really important, I think, to, to so not to ostracise cultivation, but we need to be really clever about how we do it. And, and both these examples are set for, you know, when we're establishing mid-row cover crops these days, what we've seen in the previous uh, slides is that there's enough technology around that we don't need to do seed bed prep, I don't believe. You know, we, be, we can be using um, with the right equipment, we can use no-till to get uh, a really good result. And just to, you know, for further examples, this is, to be honest, there's thousands and thousands of hectares in the, uh, in the Central Valley that are like this. I mean, they're, um, you know, their they're premise is that it's a 200 mil rainfall area. They can't afford to be having, um, you know, other plants taking water away. Um, but we can see here that anything that falls on that now is wasted. It all runs down the road. Um, I saw it in Sacramento. California was was actually quite surprisingly bad for it um, and the US in general. This is not, you know, I'm not here to slam other farmers, but the context behind this is that they're, they're used to really deep um, 
plentiful soils, which we just don't have in Australia. So they can afford to have, well, they think they can afford to have a little bit of soil loss down the road uh, because they've got, you know, six feet of it. Whereas we're dealing with bedrock, uh, we can't afford that. So, um, you know, this sort of stuff uh, doesn't have a long-term future in my, my opinion. So we, act, we go to the next two, which I've, you know, we're doing uh, do together really, is looking at plant diversity um, on, on the surface and what that does for stuff below the surface and obviously, you know, active root systems, you know, year round. So we go to the first one, you know, it's a great um, example in Napa where we had a fantastic mid-row sward growing right up underneath the vines. This is just prior to spring. Um, you know, lots of different plants, lots of different flowers. Now, all of this stuff's providing an amazing number of services. Um, obviously, above ground, um, it's providing us with an ecosystem service for beneficials, for, for pest and disease control, um, and providing a you know, fantastic habitat. And clearly, under the ground, what that's doing is that the more plant species we've got, um, the more different root systems we've got. Um, they all play a role in you know, compaction issues, breaking open soil, putting roots at bigger depths, um, they have different interaction plays between microbial uh, populations. So plant diversity above the soil um, should give us microbial diversity under the soil. And again, the more diverse a system is, the more resilient it is to change and the more things that are going on um, that potentially help uh, you know, our production system as, as we're getting there. So you know, these things aren't, uh, I think there's a real uh, opportunity for you know viticulture in Australia we're, we're pretty good at leaving um, mid rows um, with grass in them but I think maybe we can in, in, maybe work on our uh, plant mix regionally it'll be different plants but um, I think if we view that area as, a, as an opportunity to help um, you know change the way the soil structure looks at the, and the um, mineral capacity of the soil plus uh, introducing biology. Um, I think there's a really big opportunity there. We're still seeing a lot of just single monocrop uh, cereals planted um, in, in the Clarem Island especially. Um, let's introduce some diversity into the middle. And back to the sort of Terra Sancta again, we've got two things in, into play here. We've got a very different mid-row system um, as opposed to what's under vine. Again, this under vine system is there purely to provide um, root activity during winter and then as we're coming into summer you can see that it's starting to hay off and it's going to provide mulch it's provided an ecosystem for the microbial life during winter and then they're now transferring across to what is going to be slightly summer active um, mid row during the during the summer season and again we need to view these um, not necessarily as comp competitors to our production system, but adding a service that is building soil, building organic matter, building carbon, which is helping us retain moisture, providing us with microbe habitat, which hopefully will then give us mineralization of um, what is um, you know, in the soil back to our system. So it's a cycle, it takes a while to build up, but that's the premise behind um, these systems. So again, if we look at um, the the first two photos from Lindburn. Um, you know, the middle photo is, you know, the winter pasture. Again, this is all sowed. Uh, that one's not sowed every year. It's actually a perennial that they've managed to establish. Uh, but it's knee high. It's just starting to hay off in December when I was there. Um, that's done its job. And then on the left-hand side, that's the summer mix um, that's planted into the rye corn um, in, the, in the paddock. Uh, that was done two months before I got there. Uh, and it was just starting to really fire. It won't get to the same level of biomass, obviously, that the winter crops do, but it's providing a photosynthesis uh, all year round, which means we've got that carbon pump happening. Uh, we, we get no, there is no photosynthetic capability of bare soil. It just doesn't do anything. Um, if we can keep plants picking away, they don't necessarily need to be three feet high, even if they're two to three inches high. That is still doing... Um, and providing that habitat and activity that we would like um, throughout the whole season. So um, the far photo from France uh, was at their um, cereal research uh, facility, which um, they are trialling a number of different things there on commercial scale. One of the ones that really caught my eye were these biodiversity corridors um, right next to fields, where they were three to four, probably three to four metres wide planted with a diverse mix of flowering plants to provide habitat for beneficials to come in and out of the grain crops. 
Uh, they've been running these for three to four years and uh, had significantly reduced the amount of pesticides needed um, to the point where they're now ringing every field uh, with this sort of perennial flowering system. Uh, and I do believe that they'll end up um, being able to do away with it all. So again, um, if we look at the eco uh, vineyard stuff that's happening in SA, where we're looking at you know, our non-productive areas of vineyard, uh, increasing the biodiversity um, clearly has a benefit to the production system next to it. So whether it be native um, trees or plant species or shrubs or um, these flowering corridors, Again, maybe we're looking at flowering corridors every four to five rows or six rows in a vineyard that we leave um, during the system during the season to you know provide habitat. These are all these sort of things that we need to be thinking about now as we're moving towards systems that are much less uh, intensive uh, in terms of product and hopefully um, you know what we need to be doing to controlling them and we want them to, to essentially balance themselves out long term. And again, a graphic just to illustrate really, you know, we've got to, we've got to keep thinking about what's happening underneath our feet. Uh, we're, you know, we're very focused above the ground. Different species of plants will give us different activities um, under the ground and that's all providing a service um, that we don't have to do anything to. It's doing it 24 hours a day, seven days a week with no input from us if we can get them up and running. So, um, you know, who wants to work uh, harder? We all want to try and work a bit smarter. So on that, um, we had a bit of a go. We thought we'd try uh, getting a summer uh, sort of cover crop going this year. First time I, I got it, we had a good winter to be fair and we we're having a fairly strong spring. So this is uh, first week of October, <clears throat> excuse me, in, uh, in the last season where um, the sheep had grazed this right down. Uh, this is re regrowth. There's a lot of wild oats in there, but there's a, there's a really big, strong, thick mat of ryegrass, which we showed uh, showed in the previous photo that's under you know, the understory. Um, essentially, we just grabbed our old Conachet 10 disc cedar, so sort of nothing flash for sure, and, and basically just ran through there and put in a, a 10 species summer mix cover crop. <clears throat> uh, I'd love to show you a photo of it, um, three feet high and pumping. Didn't happen. Okay, so these are the things that we find. You know, it's just trial and error uh, with these systems. If I did it again, I'd say I'd probably go in a month earlier while we had a bit more soil moisture. <clears throat> Interestingly, what we thought was an experiment that um, was, a, you know, it, we didn't get the outcome we were after. Um, what we found was that we were doing every fourth row, uh, and we ended up with a really good old mid-row sward. So much so that instead of slashing the rest of the vineyard, we actually just ran the cedar through the entire vineyard, um, which was, this is a 20 hectare vineyard at home. Um, thought it raised a few eyebrows with the neighbours, I must admit, uh, wondering what we were doing. Um, but after we'd done this, we didn't have to do another tractor pass. So what was supposed to have a cover crop come up with it that we would have potentially managed with mowing or, or whatever, we ended up with a really nice bedded mulch layer um, that provided us with great um, uh, heat resistance and also kept some moisture under there for the season. And it meant we actually dropped out two, two tractor passes that we would normally done in summer. So <clears throat> again, getting back to these inputs, um, this, is, this is the sort of stuff we're um, yeah, finding as we go along. Interestingly, we got, 20, we got 50 mils of rain in February, just before harvest. And uh, a great majority of the cover crop seed that we planted came up uh, over vintage and then ran right the way through into the middle of June um, before it got cold and they got, they've got it out competed by the winter dominant grasses. So the seed still sits there. It'll be interesting to see you know, whether some of it comes up this year. Um, and you know, again, an experiment that we didn't necessarily get the result we were looking for, but we got a lot of learnings out of it and a couple of positives. Um, Animal integration, I think, is a really interesting and probably fairly important part of um, the whole regenerative ag system because if we're looking at carbon cycling and carbon pumping, you know, plants do that when they're actively growing. Uh, when they get into the reproductive phase, that slows down considerably because all our energies go from putting stuff into the soil, they're obviously putting stuff into the seed head. This is where animals can play a part because we can keep um, the, the plant in that vegetative growth cycle throughout uh, you know, for vineyards, it's obviously only going to be during the winter cycle. But um, when I looked at a lot of the grazing properties who are doing it all through the year, you know, they keep these 
plants sticking away in the really rapid vegetative growth stage, which means they're maximising the amount of uh, sunlight and carbon that's then pumped into the soil. Intensity, so livestock's important. The way you manage them in vineyards, I think, is probably almost more important. We're still seeing a propensity in, you know, again, I'm going to say McLaren Vale because that's what I'm used to, um, to do set stocking. Um, and I think that's, you know, we clearly do not get the benefit of the livestock out of that that we can when we're doing cell grazed, high intensity, constant movement um, stocking that is really driving these systems. So um, this is a vineyard in, uh, Tablis, in Paso Roble called Tablas Creek. They're one of the first vineyards in the world to do uh, they, were, they were certified organic and biodynamic. They're now being through the Rodale Institute um, doing the first um, certified regenerative ag organic, which is all these elements that we're talking about. But they had a you know, very intensive flock here of about 250 sheep um, in about a hectare, and they were moving them every second day. They have a shepherd that does it. That's his role. Um, this property is about 120 acres, um, so it's a it's a decent size and not dissimilar, probably rainfall pattern to Margaret River, um, uh, quite close to the coast uh, in a little valley, uh, has the propensity to get really hot, heavy, um, intense rainfall. So the uh, leaving amount of grass and, um, and stopping erosion is really important to them. Uh, but they were obviously getting a really good benefit uh, out of this system and it was driving uh, inputs out during spring because obviously um, yeah, they had all the grass managed down to a level um, at the first spring period where they then came back um, later in the season and had to deal with it um, as the season permitted. So um, really interesting way of doing it and something we've adopted at home. I also saw uh, cattle utilised uh, quite a lot. Um, this is uh, in California at, at an organic um, dairy and uh, they also grew a lot of almonds. And again, um, uh, infrastructure is really the bit that holds everyone back and sheep clearly need a little bit more than cattle, but this, this pot of cattle were just simply held in by one hot wire that you can see in the foreground. Uh, and they were just uh, happily wandering through um, these, this uh, armoured orchard, providing a different, slightly different service than the, than the sheep. Obviously, you know, they're heavier animals, so they're actually providing a bit of a trampling um, service here where you know they're creating a mulch layer just by walking through you know obviously they're eating some of it and the intensity is the, the other important bit about the intensity is we're intensifying the amount of nutrient um, that we're putting back into the system as well because all the manure uh, all the urine all of that stuff is in a much smaller area <clears throat> quite concentrated and providing um, yeah, that nutrient feedback loop that we're looking for uh, also out of the, in the livestock. Again, like I mentioned, we've done it at home. Um, this is just to show that uh, sometimes it doesn't all go to plan. So the photo on the left, um, uh, you'd have to say they got away from us. That is literally chest high, um, this paddock. And this is the paddock that, we, that I've had. It's the same paddock we showed the three photos in. So summer where we had the mulch. This is the one that had the, um, the cedar through it. So this is the first amount of growth. So really high biomass um, from last year. We had a great spring break. Uh, sorry, great autumn break and just grew grass and we didn't have enough livestock, so we actually struggled to get around. Um, this was eaten out by cattle. Um, so the picture on the on the right is where we finished up um, about a week later. Uh, so really high intensity numbers. They cleaned it up beautifully. They trampled a lot, so we had a really thick mat of stuff under there. And then, as you can see, a month to six weeks later, uh, we ended up with the next stand of grass, which we then and throw the cedar over and put the seed into, and then we didn't have to do anything. So it took out a whole heap of tractor passes for us uh, for that mid-row management. So this year it's been different. We didn't get a really good um, autumn break. So grass um, level has been much lower. We're managing it with sheep this year because we can get around. You know, we're not looking for the trampling effect um, that we were looking for last year. So again, management needs to change the season, um, but they, they both play a really uh, interesting role. I've added the nutrition element to the, you know, to the wheel of, of um, regenerative ag. It usually doesn't pop up, but it just came up with everything. I, everyone I talk to about it, we're always talking about nutrition. Um, what we really want to be doing here is maximising the plant photosynthetic levels. Obviously, that's driving our carbon, that's driving um, our microbial population underneath. So we've got a good healthy functioning plant, whether it be our production system plant or 
the stuff that's in the non-productive zones, then that's going to be helping the system. How we achieve that is the important bit out of all of this because really we want to be limiting our synthetic inputs. Uh, those salts have, have uh, salt Based fertilizers have, um, you know, potential damage to um, microbial activity. There's a bit of research going on about, you know, microbes uh, being dropped out of the system because plants can access things slightly easier with, um, you know, synthetic fertilizers, all of that sort of stuff. Um, it's a really interesting space and that's probably another, you know, three or four hour discussion around uh, other glasses of wine. But I think anything where we can reduce our synthetic input is a good thing. And obviously perfect soil system tests, um, you know, are really, really hard to, you know, and I don't think we need to be doing that. We need to be looking at just the major constraints. Let's get the system reasonably balanced for our area. And then let's introduce the biology and see what we can do with some plant cover and all that sort of thing. So you can't ignore the nutrition bit. It doesn't just happen uh, magically by itself. But the way we do nutrition probably needs to, and the thought process behind that needs to change a little bit. And then just sort of slightly, you know, off tap, you know, we also got to look at, maybe we need to look at the way vineyards are designed. So, so this is a vineyard in, um, again, in California, not far from Paso Roble, a bit further up. Um, it's 25 hectares. So, you know, it's not a small scale and it's been designed uh, in mind to have, um, essentially regenerative ag at its core. So uh, as we can sort of see, you know, we've got a cordon that's at one point, uh, this is at 1.8 metres, a uh, drip line at about 1.5. And the whole system's designed to have livestock in there the whole year round. So um, they're, they're taking out all of those soil management um, tractor passes and essentially the, the only time the tractor goes in there is to do fungicide spraying uh, they have set it up to be mechanised so um, uh, they can harvest it mechanically. But yeah, they're running, uh, they then they then got this block uh, cut into three or four cells and, and the flock of sheep then just rotationally work uh, their way through the vineyard throughout the whole um, growing season and in winter as well. So <clears throat> really interesting setup. You know, makes you wonder about you know, where vineyards might end up in the future, potentially if we're looking at you know, labour shortages and, you know, whether we can continue to do um, tractor work the way we do it. Um, very different. I've tried to think about development at home uh, since, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really challenging way to look at it uh, and get it to fit. But again, these are the ideas that I think uh, maybe we can get some stuff out of. They've obviously had a few issues, um, to be fair. You know, a, a cord on height of 1.8 metres takes a long time to get to, you know, so we're adding years onto our, you know, onto our development phase. Um, the sheep have been a challenge during the growing season. Um, certainly, the, they're using um, warblers, which are a much harder and much more hungry beast. Um, so they've had actually have a, a trouble with them ring barking a few vines and things. So it's not all smooth sailing. But I just really like the concept, uh, and I was really interested um, to see, you know, a novel and a different way of, of management and approach. Just slightly off topic, but I just thought it would be of interest uh, potentially is, you know, I did a trip to Africa um, looking at uh, biological pest and disease control, uh, because obviously if we're doing all this work uh, on, the, on the vineyard floor, trying to you know, improve our microbial diversity, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be having, um, you know, chemicals and, and additives that we're putting on for fungiciding um, by their nature uh, that are really good at killing fungi and bacteria. So, um, so I went to um, Kenya, Zimbabwe and South Africa, having a look at intensive horticulture, mostly berry production. So what I've got here is three examples of blueberries, uh, all grown in pots. They've all got slightly different elements and they all had, uh, interestingly, slightly different results. So if we move perhaps right to left. The, the one on the right in, in Stellenbosch in South Africa was all um, tunnel house, really high, intense, uh, high density plantings. Uh, incredible production facility, but because they had um, weed matting on the floor, they were having uh, really uh, high pest populations, specifically mealybug. Um, and if we pulled that matting back, uh, it was all lying underneath that matting. Um, and uh, they weren't really sure how they could manage that uh, because they were so used to using the weed mat and saw everything in the mid row as competition. All these systems are grown in pots, uh, as you can see. Uh, and then the two other photos, the, the plug in Zimbabwe was field grown. So they were out in the open, um, obviously up on these large mounds. 
um, and they were using uh, biological controls for um, for mealybug uh, because they, all of these all of these systems are providing fruit into uh, Europe, direct into Europe, with basically zero withholding periods on everything. So they couldn't they couldn't be using anything other than these products. And then the the photo on the left hand side, we're using less sprays than the, the guy in the middle. They had a shade cloth over the top. They had this really interesting diverse ward in the mid row, which um, was part of the native pasture when they started. Um, but it was it was considerably cooler in there um, than than the one on the far right. You know, the ground temperature was much better, and they had they were actually interestingly using um, much less spray uh, than the guys on the far right as well. So um, predators um, and prey uh, were working around in that system. So biology and Biological spray systems, I think, are coming. Uh, these guys were showing it. Cut flowers I saw in in uh, Kenya, where, again, they were doing two to three um, months uh, of the season with downy control, mealybug control, and a few other aphids and a few other things, all with microbial products, all with live um, predators released into these systems. So I don't think it's too far away, and it's a really interesting um, space that I think um, we need to pursue a little bit more um, for viticulture. So we're, you know, conscious of time. So we're we're up to the sort of you know the, the final bit. This is where we're at in our own family business. So now you know we're we're doing all of these six practices. We're trialing it out. You know, I understand that um, you know there's not a lot of data around this yet, um, but. Um, there's a fair bit of citizen science, you know, a lot of observational farmers out there doing it. And in some respects, if you see something that's working, um, although you may not be totally sure why it's working, we might not have the data to back it up. That doesn't mean that it's not a good idea. So we're in that boat. We're trying a whole heap of things. And, and really what we've done now is anything we're doing in the vineyard, we're managing through um, the two lenses on, you know, the, the right-hand side, which, which is, you know, what does it do to my soil? What does this management technique due to my soil carbon, soil organic, organic matter levels? Does it have a positive effect? Does it have a negative effect? Is it neutral? Uh, we make a decision on that. The same questions are asked of soil biology. You know, it's positive, negative, you know, do we need to do it? And then we're over to the right-hand side, which is, you know, what do we need to do these things? Do we need to make a change? What resources and inputs do we need? Um, you know, how long can we do it? And then, of course, we can't. We can't ignore the, the factor up the top, which is what's the economic impact? Um, because if we're not, uh, we're not in the, if we're in the red all the time, we're, it's no point being green. So you know we've we've got to work on uh, things that improve the system, and it might be some short term pain to get to a long term goal, um, and that's really important to understand where you want to get to, uh, because um, straight away they're going to be slightly challenging um, ways to do things. So. This is our matrix, and there's a whole heap of other questions that go with it, but I just wanted to sort of outline our thought patterns as we see our management system now. So I'm very conscious before, because farming's so seasonal and it's so rhythmic, we tend to get into, into doing things before we think about whether there's other ways of doing it or whether it's the right thing to be doing it. We're being very conscious every time we've got a change of season that we run ourselves through this matrix and, and see if we can come up with a more sustainable or regenerative solution um, to the problem out in the, out in the vineyard. And then just finally, you know, it's a bit of a, you know, how do we get there sort of thing. And, you know, really this is a, this is a circular loop because you know, there's no destination here necessarily. Um, this, is, this is about um, a, a, probably a lifelong journey, I suspect, <clears throat> but really, you know, the, the key things are there. There's no one size fits all. What I'm doing at my place may or may not work at your place. You know, you've got to, it's got to work for you. It's got to be simple, enjoyable, achievable, economic, all of those things. Um, and it, because if it's not, if it's difficult, then you won't do it. It's as simple as that. Start at a manageable size. Um, I'm a bit of a go, you know, I build a bit of a bull at a gate. I tend to do, you know, things that are slightly larger. And, and if I had my time ever again, I would have started a bit smaller. But of course, we wanted to. I wanted to make sure that we could do it at a commercial size. So we're doing. We started with 20 hectares, and we're now, um, you know, through our own properties and some management stuff, we're up to about 150 hectares of, of this style of management. So it's grown considerably, and and now that we're comfortable with it, and we understand it. It's um, it's really it's just normal if that makes sense. 
try and incorporate the six practices. Livestock is usually the one that people will get stuck on the most, and it, obviously it's the most intensive uh, and and has a has an element to it that's difficult. But if you can do it, um, I think the rewards are huge. And then really, you know, probably the stuff we all need to get a little bit better at, and I certainly do, you know, is observe, observation. We're good at measurement. You know, we need to get it. So hopefully Lynn will touch on that. You know, what are the things we need to track to see that we're having it, you know, whether it's a positive impact or a negative impact on the system and keep coming back to those things. Because it's a slow burn. It takes a while. Um, sometimes you just need those little wins uh, to keep your energy levels up and, uh and keep uh, pushing towards the end. Um, so with that, um, thanks very much for listening and um, I'll uh, go back to uh, Kate for any questions. Thanks very much, Richard. Fantastic. Kate, I, have, I do have a question, not just putting one in there, but Richard, um, Ellie Jarvis, um, I just want to know sort of what your steps are moving forward, sort of in all the, in all the um, sort of, investigation that you did through the Nuffield Scholarship um, and what you've put into practice, how would you change things moving forward with what you're doing to kind of take into consideration those uh, vintage and seasonal vari variabilities with what you've observed? Yeah. We're, we're a fair way into the program, Ellie, to be honest. I mean, we like most things, you, um, you know, we'd already started a fair bit of this uh, four to five years ago. So we've refined it considerably in the last 18 months, or probably two years to be fair. And the animal, the, the livestock uh, integration bit has been the probably the biggest change for us where we're really drilling down into smaller size paddocks and, and making sure we're moving things regularly. Um, but so for us, you know, a lot of the movement's going to be incremental. Um, I'm really conscious about input costs um, you know we in terms of fertilizer we've just moved to one um, compost application a year that's it we don't do anything else through the soil we're, we're measuring you know base levels and as long as things are ticking away in the right zones we feel like we've got enough nutrient cycling around in there with the manure so really our, our probably major focus now will be our move away from um, sulfur and copper as our major fungicide um, groups to how can we get biology into that system because some of this biology is obviously has some off-target off benefit as well they live well in the soil some of them are cellulose digesters um, some of them are nutrient um, enhancers they do multiple things so we're, we're, we're working hard to get to that stage um, whether that's a full biological program or whether it's half and half or however it is we're working our way through that and trialing a few different things and obviously, I'm really conscious about energy. Um, you know, if we're, we're trying to maximise our carbon in the soil, then obviously we're pretty conscious about how much carbon we're putting into the atmosphere. You know, I'd, I'd love to halve or even um, whatever the number is, our tractor passes in the system because that, that's, that's work that people, you know, not necessarily we're getting any value out of. Um, it's a cost. Um, machinery is a cost, all of these things. If we can, if we can change the way that matrix works, um, that's really, uh, really a, a strong focus for us. So we're, you know, we're at the nuanced end. Obviously, you're at the, if you're at the start of the journey, you need to pick something that you can have a, a tangible effect on straight away and then work your way through the, work your way through the system as you go with whatever's easiest to do. Just, just want to know, in some of the most healthy vineyards that you saw, was, were the plants standing up to some of the disease and pest pressures better without, you know, how far does that came So I think that was about sort of the healthy vineyards, whether they were standing up to, you know, some of the challenges, disease, pressure and bits and pieces, is that right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, look, I think so. I mean, the... Um, not, not that people weren't forthcoming with all the challenges that they had. But yeah, I think by and large, um, you know, these systems are pretty resilient. Um, you know, there's certainly the, the Central Otago vineyard was incredibly healthy um, and you could feel it in the soil. You know, I, I visited a number of probably 15 to 18 vineyards in that area over, over the week I was there. Um, and that, the reason I used Terra Sancta, not only was because it was, it was utilising all these practices, but it had, a, it had a very different feel about it. So this is where we get to the sort of citizen science measurement thing. Um, but for me, I think 
when you're a farmer, you can walk into a place and know that it's humming and really going well. And this place certainly was. Soil was spongy, vineyard was powering along. Um, I still think that they can do, I think we need to probably understand the limits of, you know, heart health. And, and it's a really good podcast around John Kempf does a lot on nutrition nutrition and you know having plants in a in a zone where you know they're a lot more resistant to pest and disease. I don't profess to know a lot about it. I didn't talk, I didn't make that a focus of the discussion too much when I was going around. But I think I think there's enough evidence that are now there to for us to trial it a bit better. Um, and we've been measuring bricks levels in SAP and a few other bits and pieces to try and work out you know where we sit into the scheme of things. But I've no doubt that once these systems become more mature, uh, and I think we're seeing it at home now where we're sort of five or, you know, four to five, six years into this sort of transition that, you know, we don't have to do quite as much to it. You know, 2020 was a challenging year for us. We had a light crop, but that was all to do with, you know, a wind event at the wrong time. And if I'm honest, I was hoping that I'd be the one vineyard that was just pumping and turn out the crop that was best, but I was like everyone else. So there's a point somewhere where, you know, as the farmers in the Midwest of the USA, that Mother Nature bats, bar, bats last and she carries the biggest bat. Um, somewhere along the line, we're going to have to be fluid enough to manage these situations out. But I think if, if we, can, we can have a system that's pretty robust for the seven out of 10 years where, it's, where the weather plays the game um, like we want it to, then I think there's some real savings and, and some toxic. Uh, reduction in all of that. Questions for you. Um, it's, it's Ellie again. Um, just going to your five to six years experience that you've had and your observations around the fruit that you've been taking off those vineyards and, you know, I guess the harvest um, dates and and sort of, you know, maximum brick levels at re re reaching physiological ripeness. What are your observations around the practices you've put in place in your property, but also the other properties that you consult to, and and has that changed and shifted that, and in which way? Yeah, I, look, without without having a full focus on that, you sort of get just trapped into what you're doing each vintage. I think the short answer is yes, Ellie. I think I'm seeing some some definite benefit from. I think ground cover is a really important one. Um, having that having that really thick layer of mulch all year round um, that's natural and, and, and the reflective heat uh, that we see on vineyards that don't have that. And we do a bit of uh, contract work around the place with harvesting and a few things. So we see a reasonable amount of vineyard. Uh, I think that's a big one and, and it's a real no-brainer for me to, to make sure that that's maximised. Um, the rest of it, you know, our spray programs, again, are probably a little bit lighter on than everyone else. I mean, we can run four, maybe five. Uh, in a really tough year, we'll do six fungicide sprays. So, you know, the, in just the probably the average in our area would be seven, uh, seven to eight. So, again, I think I can, you know, I'd, that's me being a bit cautious. I can maybe push that a little bit harder, uh, I think. Uh, but that's sort of, it takes a while to get out of um, what you've been doing for 30 years. So all of these things are slow burn, and to be fair, um, I think we're still still don't think we're really at the fully mature stage. You know, we we, we baselined all our carbon soil carbon on the 20 hectare vineyard uh, last year, where we GPS plotted and did 24 um, core sites. We'll go back to that in May next year and see what um, see what effect we've had on overall soil carbon. I'll be interested to see. I mean, again, we're cycling it. Um, we're, if we're, we may not be actually increasing it yet, we might be providing highly the food for microbial activity, which we have been measuring and we know is increasing. So it's a slow burn thing, Ellie. I think we're not quite sure where we're up to, but, um, you know, and wine quality is always a hard one because it's so subjective. Um, you know, a lot of our fruit goes into our own brand. Um, we're certainly, you know, seeing you know, some great results, but how you measure that's difficult. And I think... Um, we just know that when we're walking out in the vineyard yet yeah, now we've got a good feel about it and everyone's got everyone's got a good feel about what we're doing so you know that's that's also a tangible benefit that um you know doesn't get talked about enough but digging down and measuring and understanding where we're at in the journeys is a challenge and i'm hopefully, hopefully lynn will provide a bit of you know, background around that perhaps about what we need to be measuring and what what we can then come back to but um, i think we're getting there and it's certainly a lot more interesting than um having I mean, bare undervine and, and not much in the mid-road. So 
um, I'll keep you posted as we're going along. And we're, try, we're, we're trying to be pretty open source with what we're doing at home, you know, because it is such a different, well, it's not a different system, but it's it's unique to us and we're keen to share whatever we learn out of it, um, you know, good or bad, um, as we go along. Well, I think uh, we might have a break now, Richard. Thank you very much for morning tea. But um, maybe people can think while they're at morning tea and uh, the next presentation, we'll have a panel discussion. So maybe we can say some of the questions to them as well. Uh, so um, thanks very, very much, Richard. We'll see you again. Um, <laughs>